I'm a Romy, Romy, oh, since I left my home, oh, I've never overlooked a bit. Let all come as an anti-dem yet. I love the gal in Timber, too. The Bellwether Dispatch. Week the first, part the second. What it is, and what it is not, being the same thing. It is Wednesday, and the first bellwether dispatch is out and about, and working its mischief where it will, and I am home, and the fire is up, and the night is down, and that is all, as far as that. But I thought I might tell you about how things have gone in the last few days, and where they stand, what I would call the absurd fallout of Dispatch Day 1, and what others in town might describe as the very fine results of it. So, after typing up the first postcard, I hurried from the mill along the river, crossed the hundred-acre Grassel family field, and finally stepped onto Main Street, where I could not have been more dismayed to find a full regiment of my fellow citizens turned out and straddling the thoroughfare, eager to bear witness to my one-man postcard parade. I knew they might be there, of course. There had been talk of such a gathering at the prior meeting, but I rather hoped they had forgotten, or at least remembered, that I had asked them not to. I wish it were otherwise, but I suppose I blushed my way down the middle of Main Street, rushing as best I could toward my safety, that of Antigone Hall, the two-story brick building the Lemon Times calls home, where, I hoped, once through the doors, my ignominy would come to rest. But I never got inside that building to deliver my postcard to the Times editor, for there he was, Stanley Akers, just outside the hall, beaming and bowing, and with each step toward him, I knew he turned a key to something dreadful lurking in my future. There is no record of the original meeting between Vinegar and former editor Deacon Day. Suffice it to say, I am sure it took place in Deacon Day's office, at least somewhere within Antigone Hall. But it would seem that Stanley Akers had opted to take a liberty or two by coming out of doors to meet me. For some minutes on the sidewalk where we stood, I pushed my postcard at him, and tried to stick it in his pocket, and I said things like, Will you please take this wretched thing, that I may be done with it? But Stanley Akers would not receive it, until the crowd of villagers had at last gathered around us. At that point, he extended his hand, and allowed me to deliver the first Bellwether Dispatch. In exchange, he handed me a document, a one-page dramatic script, It turned out to be. I sank on my heels and even crinkled the paper towards a ball, but several elderly ladies gaped at my impudence, and I found myself quite quelled. There is nothing so quelling as the shock of old ladies, for they have seen all things, and if you've nabbed them unaware, then you've quite found the end of a brand new bad road. So, yes... I had to face it. A dramatic performance was required. I, of course, would play the part of Ronald Vinegar and Akers, that of Deacon Day. I recalled, in those vulnerable moments, that Stanley Akers was a member of the local dramatic guild, and considered himself something of an actor-slash-playwright-slash-dramaturge, and here 
In my hands was the crinkled proof, a thoroughly doctored historical exchange between Ronald Vinegar and Deacon Day. The crowd waited, unbreathing, it seemed to me, for this bit of living history, and so I found myself forced to read off my lines for purposes of resuscitation. I am here, I said, doing no work at all to unstilt the lines, to present you with the bellwether dispatch. Acres waited for the crowd to shift their attention from me to him, and when he felt fully soaked in eyeballs, he released his temper. But what is this? he bellowed. It is a shocking thing, a postcard. I wanted a weather report, Vinegar, not a dear Judy from Timbuktu. There was some stifled laughter from the crowd as Acres, in a vaudevillian aside, explained that his own grandmother was fond of referring to postcards as dear Judy's from Timbuktu, and that Acres felt comfortable assuming this likely a common slang term for postcards a century past. After his explanation, he nodded invisibly my way, that we might continue with our exchange, and the crowd veered their attentions back to me, and the pressure came to read my next line. As you know from my recent difficulties, I said, I have a box of mostly unused dear Judy's from Timbuktu, left over following the debacle of my unattended and I suppose never happened, lecture on revolutionary topics, which unattendedness left me so angered that I needed to be imprisoned, and which release was purchased only on the condition of my subsequent apology, issued on these self-same Dear Judy cards, of which you now have one. So I had the cards, you see, and no other paper came to hand, but regardless of the kind of Dear Judy thing it is, There is a weather report for the next seven days, hereto inscribed in the box, beside the fairy tale gentleman, that you are welcome to print in your paper. At this point, Stanley Akers read through the newly crafted weather report itself, making horrible choking sounds, and finally exploding in a way so startling that the crowd pushed back from us both. I wanted a weather report, Vinegar, he shouted. Monday, rain, Tuesday, wind, Wednesday, snow, Thursday, sun, Friday, clouds. What you have given me, I could get from dropping Dr. Johnson's dictionary into Mr. Boswell's meat grinder. And what it amounts to is a breach of contract, my good man, in the form of a riddle that is also a crime. And yet, he bellowed at me and the crowd suddenly stole in as his yelling suggested a coming tide of whispers, and, in fact, revealed a careful bit of acting on his part. And yet, he hissed, it is far too late for me to alter this evening's layout as you, well, no. He paused here, and the entire crowd, and me included, shut toward him like an umbrella after a rainstorm. Scandal! Stanley Acres' breath shot across my face. Scandal! You have forced me to print a sword of Damocles, dear Judy, from a ninny's fool's cap. At this, Stanley Acres doubled over with a curious mixture of pride that his writing could be so fine and derision as to the culmination of such witty contents and then gazed wide around the crowd for their apprehension of the extraordinary robustness of his gifts, both on and off the page. To which I dutifully replied to get it done as soon as possible, I have consulted the top meteorologist in the land, my lord, the librarian and occultist Miss Mary Bellwether, the only one who, to my knowledge, both possesses a Fitzroy storm glass and understands its mysteries, and this is a summary of her weather detections, as aided by that instrument, as I received it. If it does not meet your standard, 
I will make use of it as I please, for I can guarantee you this and this alone, that the Bellwether Dispatch will soon become the most highly subscribed to weather report postcard service in the history of the world. The words and substance of which I admit had rather bitten into me at that moment, in which I think, wisely or not, I performed with some level of aggression. Which performance led to some grateful applause, and following which point, my stage instructions indicated that I was meant to break into tears. Indeed, the deck suggested that I should weep as Vincent van Gogh must have wept when no one bought his paintings at one of those little hayfield markets and he was forced to stumble home, arms full of shunned masterpieces. Which vulgarity I refused to follow, and instead I skipped off to the final instruction, the only bit of the short play I truly admired, which read, Vinegar Departs. And so I did. As I left the area of Antigone Hall, and the crowd parted to let me pass, Stanley Akers shouted, Scandal! several times after me, and then louder, You've not heard the last of this vinegar! And then, This will be the ruin of me, of the Lemon Times! It will prove, in fact, the death of this town! And he moved along a route of increasingly absurd mortifications, which, though I soon could not hear them, I felt packed down over me, like the beaks of wild birds come to feast upon my hat. And as I raced around the corner and went out across the grassel field, there rose from the town the raucous crackle of great applause at the fine historical display just seen. Good Lord above, I thought to myself, what have Ronald and Vincent and I gotten ourselves into here? That evening, the postcard I'd given Acres was printed in full in the Lemon Times, along with a heavily bordered text box notice issuing his apology and his assurances that the Bellwether Dispatch would never appear in the paper again. Acres went on to say, largely making use of Deacon Day's century old note, that from that moment on, it would be the editorial policy of the paper that weather reports, and indeed, anything written by or about Ronald Vinegar, would be hitherto banned from all further editions of the Lemon Times. That Ronald Vinegar was, in a few clumsy Latin words, persona non scripta, and even if he did astonishing things, even if Ronald Vinegar built a rocket and flew it to the moon, the Lemon Times will not report it. Both Deacon Day and Stanley Akers wrote. And I should say here, as a light and somewhat bewildering aside, that there were rumors that this is what in fact happened. Rumors that Ronald Vinegar built a rocket and flew it to the moon, and that Deacon Day knew of it and kept the monumental achievement out of his paper and away from the world. For as we shall at some point learn, at the height of the bellwether dispatch craze, Ronald Vinegar suddenly disappeared. And because Deacon Day had so strongly and strangely and categorically excerpted the entire existence of Ronald Vinegar from the Lemon Times, and because he used in his rebuking language this so impossible example of Ronald Vinegar rocketing to the moon, It was exactly this story that took hold after Vinegar disappeared, 
Even to this day, if anyone should ask, whatever happened to the author of the Bellwether Dispatch? A well-meaning Lemonite will be only too happy to respond. He built a rocket and flew to the moon, where he lived out the remainder of his days. This said, of course, now in playful, insidery jest, but said a hundred years ago, by some, anyway, as though it was a perfectly satisfactory explanation. For during his drunken rampage through town on the night no one attended his lecture on revolutionary topics, Ronald Vinegar had slurringly and repeatedly laid the claim that he was constructing a rocket from the leftover wood at the crutch mill, and that his greatest achievement would be the flying of this wooden rocket into the very dust of the moon, where he would live out his days as both king and leading thinker of the unpopulated satellite. There were then rumors that the old mill had become a rocket factory, rumors that on the night Ronald Vinegar disappeared, there was seen and heard a great bright explosive something or other in the woods near his mill, and that moments following this explosion, another quite sparkly and set afire thing had gone hurtling in a gown of flame into the heavens, and further, that if you knew where to look, you could see Ronald Vinegar standing on the moon, staring back at the world that had forsaken him. Alas, my Ronald Vinegar duties continued the following day. I returned to the mill where I found nailed to the front door a scroll of paper, a list of lemon residents who wished to subscribe to the Bellwether Dispatch, and more or less, though mostly less in terms of the notion of demand, this is true to history. Ronald Vinegar did arrive the following day to find such a note, but it was slid beneath the door, not nailed to it, and there was only one name on it in 1916, that of our very first detective, the one who surmised that special clues could be found in the Bellwether Dispatch, which could lead to the discovery of the lost treasure of Amory Snow. But to speed things along, it was considered wise, and in the best interests of the charitable portion of the reenactment, the raising of money for the town hall, that we might get to the bellwether virality as quickly as possible, and that from the start all the residents in town should subscribe. Above the list of names and addresses there was a brief note, no doubt composed by our foremost local playwright, Stanley Akers. Dear Ronald Vinegar, the note began, We, the undersigned, are hopeful that your postcard weather service will continue into the future. To ensure this, we, the undersigned, would very much like to subscribe to the Bellwether Dispatch, and hope you will continue it on a weekly basis. Though your original report was printed in yesterday's paper, we would like our subscriptions to commence with a copy of that very first postcard, as we shall become collectors of the Dispatch, and besides, found it pretty and mantle-worthy and so very lovely in such a curious way. Under that message was a typewritten list of a few hundred names and addresses of local residents, and below that a huge furl of lined empty pages. These latter pages, it was hoped, would fill up with the names and addresses of other people, people from out of town who lived elsewhere. Who these other people were, 
and why they would travel to Lemon and walk through wild fields to find an abandoned mill that appeared on no map, all to sign up for an inaccurate weather postcard service, was beyond me. But I will say this. At the very bottom of the list, there were three dozen freshly inked names of new persons scribbled into place. Out-of-towners and people I'd never heard of, who lived in places that were not Lemon, had signed themselves up for a subscription. And as I looked about me, I was shocked to see that there were other strangers coming toward me in the woods, and I was forced to tuck inside the mill to hide from these persons, and I stood in the darkness by the door and listened to them scroll their names upon the sheets and murmur their wonder about what the treasure might be and where it might be and whether they would be clever enough to find it. And so it seemed, as unlikely to me as Ronald Vinegar rocketing to the moon, that the great modern version of the bellwether dispatch craze had somehow begun. After a quietness came and the strangers departed, I took the subscriber list off the door and went deep into the heart of the mill and sat at Ronald Vinegar's old desk and began the long, dark, dismal task of feeding postcards into his old typewriter, one by one, and typing out the names and addresses of all the new subscribers, which at that moment with my slow fingers, felt to already include all the peoples living on the earth. Those curious about inaccurate weather reports, or eager to uncover a portion of the buried treasure of Amory Snow, or those who simply like postcards or subscribing to things that are free, may sign up by sending their name and address to bellwetherdispatch at gmail.com. If you would like only to see the postcard, make that intent known, and you will be given a secret address on the internet which shall reveal it. Each postcard, real and virtual, will contain clues to a small pleasing treasure to be found somewhere in New Hampshire. A bag of doubloons is what the contents most resemble from the days of Amory Snow. Those finding the treasure are requested to take only a single sample of what is to be found and to leave the rest for others. Finally, the only payment the town of Lemon requires is that you send photographic proof of your treasure finding, of yourself with the treasure at the secret treasure site, and that you send such images to bellwetherdispatch at gmail.com that we here in Lemon might then proselytize in this manner and achieve the great profit from multiplying seven billion by the cost of stamps and subtracting that by a figure otherwise known as zero. Further information about the treasure hunt and postcards may be found at radioghost.com. Lastly, these rains of strong, strong bees. P.S. Infinity. <laughs>